Open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 10. Uh, We are going to continue our series on rebuilding our life in Christ. Today we're going to be talking about our commitment, commitment to what matters. And I think it's a special time to be talking about our commitment to the Lord as we think of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a beautiful picture of God's commitment to us. It's Christ's commitment to us in going to the cross, committed to deal and and to crush sin, to crush the enemy, to provide eternal life to those of us who put our faith and trust in him. And that display of commitment is something that I believe that we are called to mirror when it comes to our walk with the Lord, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, that we are committed to follow the commands of God, committed to follow his ways, committed to be on mission All of these commitments that we make when we come to building our life in Christ and prioritizing Christ uh, in our walk and how we live. But as you know, and and as I I sometimes find myself in, I can get committed to the things that derail me from being committed to what God has in store for me. And so we can easily get distracted. We can commit ourselves to a career or, or commit ourselves to even family or children or grandchildren and things that distract us from from following the ways of God. Because commitment to good things doesn't always mean it's the best thing. And so even the commitment to certain things are things that can be distractions for us when it comes to committing ourselves to the Lord. And so I hope that we can unpack that a little bit today and talking about committing to what matters. Because I believe that when we look through Ezra and Nehemiah, we see an incredible commitment of the Jewish remnant who are, who are, have, God has opened a door through King Cyrus, who gave a decree to allow the Jews to go back into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and then later to build a wall around the temple to protect it. It took incredible sacrifice, incredible commitment to accomplish what God had opened the door for them to do. And so we're going to pick up at the end of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 10, or near the end, So what's happened is everything has been accomplished. The temple has been built. The wall has been built. They have confessed their sins. They have have performed sacrifices. They have done all of these things. And now they're coming to a place where they're, they're putting themselves and committing themselves to a new covenant with the Lord, to, to a, really a recommitment to the covenant that God had, had, had put with Abraham that had been passed down from generation to generation and then even to Moses, to the people of God in that time. And then through the exile and through all these things, they're now recommitting themselves to the Lord and to his work. And so we're going to pick it up in Nehemiah chapter 10, starting in verse 28. And so the word of the Lord says this. It says, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God. That's really important. So here we've got all the people, all the remnant, everyone that has declared that Yahweh is Lord, everyone that has come and committed themselves to serving and being a part of the people of God and walking with Yahweh. They have separated themselves from the peoples of the land. Now, the peoples of the land were those that were sent in several hundred years before by the Assyrian king to try to assimilate the people. And we talked about that last week when we come to our faith and facing opposition with people that don't believe what we believe. And we encounter that on a regular basis. And are we ready for that? And are we prepared for that? And will we stand up for our faith and speak for our faith when it comes to those situations in those times? But the people of God have declared... They are separating themselves from an an, an opportunity to not only separate from them, from the people who have declared another way, not God, but they've gone and they've separated themselves, but now they've come to the law of God. And that is really important. We think about when you separate yourself, what what are you committing yourself to? And they here are committing themselves to the law of God. And we'll get into that when we think about our commitments but they have separated themselves from the lostness of the world and committed themselves to the law of God. And it says to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God. It's interesting how they talk about that when you talk about coming into covenant with God. They look at that and they identify it is a curse and and a covenant that they come into, a curse and an oath. And why would they use that terminology? Because in the Old Testament, when they talk about if we commit our ways to God, that we will be blessed, we will be in right, right relationship with the Lord. But if we don't, 
that we will encounter curses, we will encounter struggle, we will encounter the wrath of God. Now, what's important for us to understand is that the cross of Jesus Christ, the cup of the new covenant, Jesus Christ drank the wrath of God and protected us from it. So when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are shielded from the wrath of God because God's just wrath was satisfied at the cross of Christ. A difference between the old covenant and the new covenant when we look to Jesus and we look to the cross of Christ. But here it's this commitment of basically saying, we are committed to the Lord, but we also understand and are committing ourselves to know that if we stray from our commitment, that we know what would come of us as we turn away from God. And so they were making a commitment, fully understanding of what was at stake. You think about in our own lives, when we commit ourselves to things, when you think about my commitment level, right? You evaluate the pros and cons. If you're smart, if you want to look at things, sometimes there are things that you want to commit yourself to and you get into it and all the way into it and you never evaluate it. And all of a sudden it's the what ifs or the, oh man, I didn't really think this through. What am I doing? How do I get out of this? What do I need to do? You know what I'm talking about because you go through those situations. But for most of us, we want to commit the positives and the negatives. We want to know what we're going to expect, what we're going to encounter. And for these people, they understood But the beauty for us when it comes to the gospel, that when we commit our life to Christ, we are fully restored. We are washed clean by the blood of Christ. We are promised eternity and it cannot be taken away from us. And all the only pain, the only backlash that we will encounter is just continuing to live in this broken and fallen world until we go into glory when we die and we go to the other side to be with Christ. And I'll tell you what, I will take that curse which I don't even believe to be a curse at all because eternity is so much more than what we hear, hear, see and experience on this side of eternity. It is so short-lived here to, experiences, to experience the discomforts of this world as it relates to following Jesus Christ because in the, he's worth it. Man, he's worth it. But here they came into this and they understood the curse and the oath to walk in God's laws that was given from Moses, the servant of God, And then, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his rules and his statutes. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Here again, a reiteration. Several weeks ago, we talked about making hard decisions. And we, we use in, in studying the scriptures and talked about when many of these folks gave themselves over to foreign wives and foreign spouses and, and against the will of God, against the testimony of God and his word. And how all of the ramifications that came from that. But here they're committing themselves again. We are not going to go down that same road that we once did. We are not turning back and going to become what we once were. We are committed to the law of the Lord. And we're making that declaration that where we once were, we will not go down there again. Truly a declaration and visible evidence of repentance. But then in verse 31, they continue. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. And remember, this is very important because there were all kinds of people in all different faiths going on around them. And there were people that did not believe and respect the law of God. And so they would come and they they would want to trade and sell goods and do these sort of things. And And the Jews here were saying that we will not do that. We will honor the Sabbath day. And we will get more into that in a minute. But he says, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or or on the holy day, on a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and exaction of every debt. Again, what they're doing now is they're going to talk about some of the things that we'll look at from back in 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 the Pentateuch, where they talked about ways that they were supposed to honor the Lord and how they were to live. And it is their declaration and commitment. And so they continue on. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of the shekel for the service of the house of our God. Now, what's interesting about that is that actually is not a required gift that they were to give. It was a free gift that they were giving above and beyond what they had already committed to. This was something new that they had done because they had neglected the temple for so long and neglected how the operations of it and all that was required of it. And so now they're giving a new offering here, uh, an extra... uh, shekel here for the service of the house of God. And it would to go towards for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, 
and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of God. So again, just that declaration of understanding of what is this money going towards. It is going towards all these things for the temple and going towards all these things to help them continue to worship God the way God called them to worship in the Old Testament. And so when we read all of this, what I want us to go into now is think about when we see their commitment level and what they are committing themselves to, what are the things that we can take from that and apply to our own life today to where we need to think about how we need to be committing our life to God in order to rebuild our life in Christ. Because that is our goal. We are trying to build our life on the foundation of the gospel, to rebuild our life in Christ, to focus on the things of God, to live for God, to honor God, so that lost people will be found as they see Christ in and through us and through our life. So what do we commit ourselves to? We talked about it very briefly in the beginning, but here for us, when we commit to what matters, we commit to walking in the ways of the Lord. You see that very evident here when they said, you know, we are choosing ourselves to separate ourselves from the other people and we are going to look towards the law of God for living, for for direction, for guidance. And so for us today, we think about, we have the canon of Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament, all coming together, inspired by God for us to live by and to follow and to understand the character of God and who He is to be drawn to him through the power of his word, but for the purpose of not only reading it and knowing who God is, but reading for the purpose of obeying it. Because as believers in Jesus Christ, we are called to give our life to him and to obey in response to what he declares. It is not an obedience in seeking approval. It is an obedience of praising God for what he has done to honor God and knowing that his ways are better than our ways. And so when we commit and obey to the, obey the Word of God, it is not some just give and take. It is not some barter pursuit that we're on and trying to please God so that He'll be better pleased with us, but truly believing and committing our ways to the Lord and so that we can honor Him in how we live. And in Proverbs, it says this. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding." And so when we think about for us, we can be so tempted in life and making decisions and choices. We think we've got it all figured out. Or we think that we can work through a situation and we can apply our own wisdom and our own discernment to a situation, neglecting the Word of God to help give us greater wisdom and insight into how we should live and how we should work. And so, but he's saying, trust, and trust the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. It's a challenge of surrender, of faith, of saying, you know what? I think I may have the answer here, but I want to seek the Lord for greater wisdom and guidance because he may have something better. He may have something different than what I feel like should be right for me. And sometimes that means abandoning our own understanding, our own wisdom to follow God's. Because when it comes to following God, it, it is a testament to our faith. And God will oftentimes call us to remove logic and take steps of faith beyond what we would be comfortable with, but in order for God to be glorified. And so for us, we think about following God with all of our heart. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And I want to encourage us when we talk about walking in the ways of the Lord, stop compartmentalizing God. Stop putting God in his God box so that you can have all of this for yourself and only keeping God just right here protected in this one little part of your life. It says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Let God into every avenue of your life because he will make it better. He will make it richer. He will make it stronger. He will bring greater fulfillment in it. Because if we just continue to leave God in this little box and we live most of our life about us and about what we want and and what we're committed to, we're going to find greater stress and greater struggle, greater anxiety, greater worry, greater disappointment, lack of fulfillment, all of these things when we abandon the Word of God and we abandon the ways of God and we try to push God out of many things in our life. But what I'm saying is God's called us to let Him in in all of it. And I promise you, you will see greater fulfillment and you'll see greater richness come to your life because there are so many things that we commit ourselves to that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The world will still continue to turn. God will still continue to be God. But for us, we get so hung up on so many different things. Maybe it's politics. Whether you, if your candidate doesn't win, the world is going to end. And I can promise you for 
40 plus years of my life, I have seen many presidents and politicians come and go, and God is still king. But yet we get so anxious and so worked up. Maybe it's your sports team that you get so anxious about, and all these things in life is just not going to be the same if they don't win. And I can promise you it will be. Today is still another day, right? And so we, <laughs> exactly. It was tough, though. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> but I'm committing to what matters. And so we think about, but we want to walk in the Lord. But guys, there are so many things that you're committing yourself to that I promise you right now, if you let go of, God's got something better. If you're committing yourself to something that is bringing you great struggle, great heartache, great stress, it's creating friction in your marriage, friction in your relationships and in life, let go and let God, as we always say. But we need to commit our ways to the Lord. Another thing here, and what we're going to go into now is a few things that, that draw, are drawn out of the Old Testament. Now, we know that from the Word of God, that when we see what God challenges and what God tells us, that we can trust in, in what Christ has done and what Christ has accomplished. He has fulfilled the whole law. We are no longer obligated to the law. We live by faith through grace that is extended to us by Christ. And we live in that way, but for us, there's still the great wisdom to follow when it comes to following the teachings of the law and how we live our life. And one of those ways is seeking rest. Now, in, in the, what they are talking about in the scripture is going back to Exodus chapter 20. It says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And for them, they were to honor the Sabbath day. They were to take that day. And it started on Friday night and then goes into in sundown and into in sundown on the next day on that Saturday. And they weren't to work. They weren't to do anything. They were to have that time separated and isolated to God. Now, we are not called to and, and have to be obligated to a Sabbath day. But there is incredible wisdom when it comes to seeking rest. And guys, we need that in this culture and in this time. We look at today, now in, in today's New Testament culture, we look at the Lord's Day, which is the first day of the week. That's why we come together on Sundays. It is the first day of the week. We give God our first. And so we come and we worship Him on Sunday mornings and we come celebrate what He's doing in our lives together as a body of believers in hopes that we come out of this rested and rejuvenated and recharged to go and live and be on mission. But the problem is, guys, we come in here and I guarantee 90% of us are exhausted, straight up tired. You have not stopped. You have not slowed down. You've been working all week or you've got littles and, and, you're, and you're going through all of that and all that goes on to. And you've taken no time to seek rest. Even when I think and when I talk to people, how is your quiet time? How is your time with the Lord? And most of us would always say, man, it is so small. I can't seem to find the time. But when we commit to what matters, we need to commit to, to, com, to commit to taking that time to rest in the Lord. And I'm not talking about just taking naps on Sunday afternoon, <laughs> although those are great and those are holy naps, I promise you. But at the same time, I'm talking about true rest in the Lord, finding rest when you're in the Word of God, finding rest in prayer, even rest in fellowship with other believers. Like when you think about our men's ministry, when you think about our men's retreat, for some of you maybe in here, you're thinking, dude, I work so much during the week. Going on a weekend retreat sounds just incredible. Like just, I'm gonna be exhausted, right? But the reality is when you come together as men in Christ, that should be a time of seeking rest, not work. It should be a time of coming together and being together and being encouraged and strengthened by one another. I think we don't understand what rest means, whether it be the Sunday nap or sitting on the couch and watching a ball game or, or whatever you, you're excited about, what you enjoy doing. Rest in the Lord is the greatest and most purest form of rest that will give you greater strength for what's ahead. And so for us, when we think about seeking rest and what the Lord calls us to, we may not be called to ob be obligated to a Sabbath day, but there's still so much value and worth to seeking rest and committing to that. The next thing that we saw here in this passage that I think is very important for us when it comes to committing to what matters is committing to forgiveness. Committing to forgiveness is something that can rob us of incredible joy and, and, and rob us from many, many years of our life if we are not careful. Now, what they're talking about in this context in Scripture is they're referring back to Deuteronomy when it comes to the forgiveness of debts. 
And this is what they're referring to. In Deuteronomy 15, it says, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. That's a pretty good deal, right? Take out a loan of seven years. I don't care what you still owe on, it's gone. I'll take that. But you shouldn't do that anyway. He shall not exact it off of his neighbor, his brother, because of the Lord's release has been proclaimed. But of a foreigner, you may exact it. But whatever of yours is with your brother, your, you and shall, what? <laughs> Somebody might have had a typo in there. Let's go to Deuteronomy 15. Let's get the word, not Matt's typing expedition there. Here we go. But it says, of a foreigner, you may exact it, but whatever of yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. And so you think about here what he's talking about for those that, that come into a debt, come into an ob obligation after seven years of fulfillment, after seven years of being invested in a situation where you've been paying back and doing this, the blessing to a brother is to forgive that debt. The blessing is to let go of that, to not harbor that and hold it over somebody's head. But it does say to the foreigner, there's a different level of accountability. And for those in those situations, there is a situation where they don't have to honor this in that way. They interact with them differently. And I would even say, even within the church today, there's some different things that we do differently amongst one another that we do with lost people. In the sense of not being brothers and sisters in Christ, we may operate differently in certain ways. It doesn't mean we, we love others more than, than, than them, but at the same time, they should see our love and how we live but yet there are privileges and there are blessings to be a part of the kingdom of God and be a part of the body of Christ. And so, but we see here that letting go and that forgiveness of debt, but it's forgiveness is beyond just, just allowing someone to be forgiven of a debt that they owe. Forgiveness is also something that we do and that we, that we extend and that we give for the purpose of, of being free of the stress and the strain of a broken relationship or a problem. I think it's easy for us to, to, to go and to ask forgiveness of someone, and I believe to go and, and to be humble and say, please forgive me, I've made a mistake and allow them to, to ask forgiveness. I think the harder thing for us is that when we harbor unforgiveness in us when we've been wronged, and especially when that person will not come to you and ask for forgiveness. And we wanna, harbor, we wanna hold on to that and clutch that and, and withhold forgiveness from somebody, especially when they haven't asked for it. But I'm telling you now, forgive them regardless of whether or not they ask you. Because I promise you, you are carrying the greater burden than they. And so when you think about forgiveness, when you think about how we live, that we wanna to commit to what matters and what matters is extending forgiveness. We wanna forgive like the Lord has forgiven us, where we have been forgiven of all unrighteousness. Who are we to hold on and to withhold forgiveness from another when Christ has forgiven us of all things. And so for us, that looks differently. Sometimes maybe it's someone that we've loaned money to and we forgive them of their debt in a purpose of trying to bless them and allow them to go on freely to do what, whatever they need to be doing to get back into financial peace and, and restoration. We wanna help and, and oblige and bless people like that. For others, forgiving them when they haven't asked for it or forgiving when they come to it. But even for us seeking forgiveness and not being ashamed and not being afraid to go and do the hard thing of asking for forgiveness when we know that we have wronged somebody. But we must commit to forgiveness in life. And we must also for commit ourselves to generosity. You see that played out here in this text when they talked about the, the extra tithe that they were giving to the house of the Lord. And you go back and when you look to the building of the sanctuary, to building of, of, of the, the temple that was being done with Moses in the tabernacle that was being constructed and put together at the Lord's instruction. Here's just a little bit about what they did. Bezalel and Oholiab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of all this of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord had put skill. 
everyone whose heart stirred him up to come and to do the work. And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work of the sanctuary. And they still kept bringing free will offerings every morning. So not only did they provide for the sanctuary, for the work of the priests, for the sacrifices, but they continued to provide free will offerings. They were, these were offerings that people just gave as they were prompted by the Spirit of God to give. And here they did. And for us as well, we want to commit ourselves to being generous. You know, I think about even when you look at, at last month for us as a church in January, we, we came and we gave and we gave double what we gave last year. When you factor in the gift to the general giving and you factor in the money that was given towards our advanced campaign, and then you pile in on top of that the generous tithes that were taken for, for things such as the, the medical bills of, of someone in our community or to helping someone to get back on their feet and helping pay a security deposit for a lady to go and to be able to get a place to get back on her feet in a bad situation. All of this was taken place by the generous giving of the people in our church. And so when we think about things like, can we still give to a building campaign and still do the work of the Lord? Amen, absolutely. Can we still give to the kingdom of God and continue to do the things of God? Absolutely. And we do all of this even as a church, as we talk about without even passing a plate. Because we have our giving tower that you can give and you can give on your time and your way to the Lord. And we trust that God's gonna put it upon your heart to give to the work of the Lord, even today. As you think about how your giving impacts our community, how your giving continues to help the pastors and leaders in this church to do what God's called them to do, how your giving helps us to be more generous and more giving to those in our community, to allow us to do greater ministry, to have a thriving children's ministry and a student ministry and all of these things because of our generosity, all the while still raising money to help build a building for us to have our own place. Because the reality is, guys, you never know in the culture that we live in today, we may be politely asked to leave because of the difference of faith that we have amongst the public school system. But you think for us, when we think about being generous, I celebrate our church last month. And that, that is not to say you always pray, hesitate to celebrate, right? Like, whoa, 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 we still need, we still need it. Don't, don't hit the pause button, right? But at the same time, we still celebrate the generosity of you for giving and believing in what God is doing through his church. And so I praise you for that. And I thank you for that. And your commitment to the church and to the building campaign, but also continuing to commit to the needs of those in our community that we just continue to put our foot on the gas and do whatever God raises up for us to do. And so for us, we look at all these things as I pray that we commit together as we commit to walking in the ways of the Lord, we commit to seek rest. We commit and, and to find forgiveness and to extend forgiveness. And we commit to be generous. And to be honest, I believe all of these things tie in to the beauty of the Lord's Supper. Because when you think about what did Jesus come to do? He declares he came to do the will of the Father. He came to commit his ways to the Lord. And what did Jesus tell us to do? to come to him, all who are weak and weary, and we will find what? We will find rest. And then what did he do? He allowed us the opportunity to be forgiven of all of our trespasses through his shed blood so that God's just wrath could be paid in full through the perfect sacrifice that was Jesus. And he did it very generously as he gave all of himself for us. And so when we think about committing to these things, committing to these things that matter, the greatest way that we can do that is to observe the Lord's Supper together. And so for us today as a church, we're gonna do it a little differently this time as I'm gonna invite our deacons that are gonna be a part of this to come forward today um, for my five deacons that I have committed to, to help pass the plate. Um, today, instead of inviting you forward, what, what we're gonna do is take advantage of the opportunity of our deacons who God has raised up to help continue in leading of our church uh, they're going to help be a part of distributing the Lord's elements today for us. Uh, as we take the bread and we take the juice together, I'm going to ask Jeremy to come forward. It's, we're going to have a little bit of music while we come. But what I want to do is I want to pray because God, because God tells us to prepare our hearts for this time. And God tells us to reflect on, on the beauty of what Christ has done. And so I pray that we've come in here probably with many worries and many anxieties and stresses and struggles I want God just to, to write our heart in this moment in time as we reflect on the beauty of the Lord's Supper together. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the blessing that it is to come to your table today. 
God, we thank you and praise you for the worship that we've enjoyed this morning as we sing praises to you. God, we thank you for the reading of your word and its power to pierce our hearts, even to the bone and marrow within us, God, to, to bring about repentance, to bring about restoration, rejuvenation, and excitement. God, we thank you for the Lord's Supper. We thank you for the body that was broken for us by Jesus. We thank you for the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And Father, we thank you that through that, the resurrection has come through the power of your spirit, raising Christ from the dead so that we could have eternal life when we put our faith and trust in you. And God, as we remember our Lord today, I pray that whatever distractions we brought in here today, that God, you would remove those from our hearts and minds. And as we take of the Lord's Supper and we reflect upon you and your goodness and your mercy and grace, that you would just embolden us, excite us for what is ahead and for how you are gonna use us as we commit our ways to you. Father, we love you. And we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching the message today. If it was an encouragement to you, be sure to like the message. Also subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit that notification bell so you can be updated as new messages come online that I pray will encourage you and encourage your walk with Christ.